Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today or watching in the distant future. It wasn't too long ago that data was not yet part of our taproom daily vocabulary. However, when making quality beer the prerequisite, running a strong business can be your advantage. Today, our panelists will share their expertise and insights into leveraging taproom data to drive business growth, enhance customer experiences, and streamline operations. From analyzing sales trends to motivating your team, this session will help you explore facets of the taproom and all of them where bettering your grasp on data can help you your business see greater success. So now let's meet our guest and Earl, you're to the right of me. You get to go first. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I am Earl Holman. I'm the owner and general manager of Crooked Crab Brewing Company. Uh, we're in Odenton, Maryland. Um, so I pretty much wear all of the hats from overseeing production to managing the tap room to managing wholesale. I have my hands kind of everywhere. Why Crooked Crab? What is the significance? Uh, just we're a Maryland local brewery through and through. Uh, Maryland loves their crabs. So I really need to make it up your way soon. I swear I'll be there eventually. You're not that far. I know. You're making me feel guilty. Brad, your turn. You're a little bit uh, farther from me, but I actually have been to Funkworks a long time ago. Good. Good. Well, I'm Brad. I have been in the industry for, I want to say, about 15 years. Uh, originally, I worked for Deloitte. I was a CPA. Uh, and then I worked in commercial real estate and then decided that I wanted to start a brewery. That was about 2009. Went to brewing school um, and then opened Funkworks with uh, my business partner, Gordon, in 2010. Uh, in 2015, we opened Barrel House, which is about two miles from us as the crow flies and is primarily a uh, taproom brewery, while Funkworks has always had a little bit more production. Brad, do you miss being a CPA? Just a CPA, I should say. <laughs> um, no. I don't miss that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess there are times I guess I miss it, but I miss some of the friends I had within that. Um, but do I miss working 60 hour weeks? I do not. Yeah, so that sucked. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I like the industry. And I think I'd always, I had read somewhere that more people start businesses with like a CPA thing or something along those lines from a degree. And that was why I did it. I don't even know if that's true, but that was the reason why I did it. I, I mean, did it you have a good skill set there, I'm sure. Yeah, it's useful. It has its moments. Brittany, thanks for joining us today. Hi, I'm Brittany. I work for Epidemic Ales. I'm the taproom manager. Um, I've been the taproom manager since 2019. Um, we're just about to celebrate our eighth anniversary. We're out in Concord, California. Um, and I've kind of been helping out since the beginning, um, but I love it. Uh, so I'm kind of the newbie of the group, but really enjoying it. And all my conversations with you, you are so dedicated to learning and bettering yourself. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. And last but not least, Audra, it was a good time seeing you in New York. Now we're together virtually, so welcome again. Yeah, thank you. I'm Audra Gejunas. I own Brood for Her Ledger. I am a fractional CFO, CEO for the beer industry. I've been in the industry for a little over 16 years. Started out as the controller, the dogfish head, moved on to be the chief financial officer of Mother Earth Brewing. And then in 2013, I went out on my own and I work with roughly 350 breweries from coast to coast, uh, an accountant by background. So Brad, high five for that. Um, and, uh, but they do a lot more financial strategy now. I am the fractional CFO of Burlington Beer Company currently. Uh, most recently, prior to that, I was the CFO of Crooked Dave out of Denver. And I am based out of Asheville, North Carolina, although this week I am in Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin. So go Badgers. So Audrey, you wear a lot of different hats and you have a lot of different loves in your life. <laughs> but when you were a kid, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? I thought I would be a veterinarian. My dad was a physician and I've always loved math and science, always very much left brain. My dad was an ear, nose, throat doctor and I wanted to work with animals. I grew up on a farm in Northern Illinois. Um, my parents still live there. And I wanted to be able to help sick animals, but do it through science. So, yeah. I almost wanted to say you help sick breweries. That's probably not a good thing to say though. So we'll just yeah, forget I'm that, that I said that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very much a therapist, a financial therapist right now. Our industry is going through a tough time. So It is. <laughs> so everyone here today, I want to ask everyone just a kind of rhetorical question, but let's start here. When did you first feel taproom data creeping into your business and why do you believe it's important? Take it however you like. And Earl, we'll let you start this one off. Then anyone jump in at any point. Um, 
honestly, for me, I, I've always been a numbers guy. I was a computer science major in college and I was working in the IT industry for a long time. I'm a spreadsheet guru. So for me, I've been crunching numbers pretty much since the beginning um, from, from day one. I love looking at uh, sales um, analysis. I love looking at um, just like how our beers are performing. Um, I think just like from the very beginning, pretty much I've, I've dive, dived into it. That's part of the part of what I love about it. Awesome. I, I would say for myself, I started um, right as we started up, I kind of neglected the tap room. I didn't even really want a tap room, which is now in retrospect, dumb. Uh, but at the time, that was what I, I felt. And so I kind of was like, ah, this is really making cash, um, but ignored it for several years and then recognized somewhere in the 2013 timeframe after we've been open for about two to three years that I was missing an opportunity and started looking at that at that point in time. Uh, and taking it much more seriously than I had before. And we started to see serious gains from our tap room pretty quickly after that. Brad, did you look at it even deeper, you know, during the pandemic and following? Um, no, during the pandemic, I don't think that I looked at it as, as the pandemic itself, um, as we were, I guess we were shut down. And, but I think after that, I started changing things around and a lot of stuff that had been set in um, place that I, I started changing. But some of it was by necessity too. I mean, I, I remember like we had, I don't know how many, let's say we had somewhere around 200 barrels of draft beer sitting in inventory at a certain point in time. And I was like, how am I going to move this product? And we had never had growlers before or crowlers. And it was like, okay, well, I guess we're going to do crowlers and growlers. And so then I started looking at that. But like for the most part, I would say for the, uh after the pandemic for the next two years it was predominantly just a scramble um to kind of get back up to what the numbers were or whatever it would be i'm just trying many different things was that a part of it sure but the reality was i didn't have a lot of historical data and it all seemed kind of out of the norm good thoughts there yeah definitely i um i definitely don't make those big decisions like we're buying a canning line, but we, we bought a canning line during the pandemic because there was no way to really move the product as quickly as we wanted to, especially with just doing crawlers and growlers. Um, but I go to go back to your initial question. Um, I see it kind of on a smaller scale, like my numbers, my data enters my life when, um, I notice like a new beer that we're just playing around with. So sometimes the brewers will do a one-off for me for um, a beer pairing we're doing and um, we don't can it. So then I notice how many crawlers end up going during that time and stuff like that. So I kind of view the smaller taproom picture um, and the data that way. Um, it's It's been interesting, um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm definitely not a CPA. So the numbers are not as strong for me. Because you didn't come in with the same numbers background. You know, when in your time as a taproom manager, did you realize, oh, I should be looking at these metrics? Was there like an aha moment you had? Yeah, I mean, I still to this day go, oh, I'm not looking enough at this. Um, I kind of hear things from um, our owner who is was a CFO at his last job. And we will talk about things sometimes and I realize, okay, I need to focus on that a little bit more. Um, but what I can provide to him is, you know, if there's a weekend where we had a really good numbers, but it seemed really slow, it's because we sold so many to go. So what was the reason for that? You know, that kind of thing is uh, where he and I get to kind of meet, meet minds. Awesome. Thank you. Audra, I'd like to change the question just a little bit for you. I mean, you yeah. interact with so many breweries all across the country. From your viewpoint, how has breweries understanding and respect for data changed over the past five years? Um, it is, it's changed a lot in that um, now taproom managers are being involved. So let's say, like, take the budgeting process, for example. When we would go through the annual budgeting process and the quarterly refreshes that follow, it was very much a top down sort of process of where I'm working with the owners. I'm working with the head brewers. We're talking about how much beer we can push through the tap room. But the tap room manager wasn't really involved in any of that process, nor any of those metric bills. And now we're seeing the tap room manager being brought in to the overall budgeting process. So whereas we're pulling in these tap room metrics, 
they are part of that process. And the understanding has gained, has made some gains because people have recognized the importance that financial literacy plays within our overall operation. And for everybody to be able to be on the same page, you have to elevate everybody's financial literacy to a certain base point. So getting some sort of education to understand the basics of the balance sheet, the income statement, the statement of cash flows, what variable costs versus fixed costs are, what is overhead, you know, the cost components per each product, get everybody, regardless of their role within the brewery, to that particular level, and then you can start working together as a team. So there's been a lot more of a focus on financial education. People recognize that it is going to be a team effort. So there's been a much greater respect than, um, than I would say even five years ago. They're using the, the data has always been there. It, they just haven't used it and, um, and elevate everyone's literacy to the point of where, hey, and I'll have the power to make these decisions and I understand how my role plays within that particular within the particular brewery in the operation. Great, great thoughts there. And I appreciate all you do to just educate brewers on financial literacy. It's so important. I love it. It's one of my passions. I love seeing the eyes light up for somebody that is a non-financial manager. Let's say they're an English major or you major anything and other than numbers, especially accounting or finance, and be able to create a relatable way that they can, the, the, like their eyes light up. They're like, oh, I understand the current ratio. I understand what that means. I know it's a measure of liquidity and how they can relate it. So anytime I can break down complex financial topics into like an easy digestible format, they can utilize immediately within their operation. That means I have done my job. <laughs> yeah. So now I like to kind of transition what you just said to our friends on the brewery side right now. For <laughs> all of you running tap rooms and breweries, how do you take this tap room data and share it with your team to make it something they can understand and digest? Like, what are you all doing to make that accessible to them? Um, for me, um, I look at our numbers weekly and uh, first at a high level, I just send out like weekly dashboard, like snapshots to um, our respective um, owners of their teams. So that's our head brewer, our tapper manager, um, and our head chef who runs our kitchen, um, just so they're aware of what just happened, what's happening. And then I try to parse out the data and talk individually to, you know, I'll talk to our production staff and say, hey, like these brands are moving, like let's let's do more loggers or whatever. Um, you know, these are moving not quite as well. And, you know, we have to be work really hand in hand on like how much draft versus package we hold for the tap room. What are we pushing out in wholesale? Um, and that's kind of a um, evolving like river, so to speak. Um, so that's on a weekly basis. I talk to them and I just kind of disseminate numbers and I do the same thing with our tapper manager. Um, hey, like this is what's happening. This event did really well. This programming didn't do quite as well, whatever it may be. Um, but then we also have monthly meetings, management meetings between all of us, because as our team started really small, it was just two of us. It was me and our head brewer when we first opened in 2018. We now have 27 people that work in our company and we have a tendency of everybody works in their own silos where, you know, our, our production staff is um, just making beer our tap room is just running the tap room our head chef is running the kitchen our sales manager is running sales and nobody's really talking to each other so just getting a i'm the tether that connects everything um so i have a tendency of being really busy i know what's going on in everybody's silos but getting everybody together and just talking about what's happening what are we doing right now um what are the numbers looking like um, is important as we've grown as a company do you have set days each month you have these meetings so people can always have them on the calendar or how do you schedule them? Yeah, we usually, we've been doing it just like the first Thursday of the month. Um, is It's usually casual, but if we can plan for it, then it's something that we've been able to make happen. Thanks for sharing that. Brad or Brittany? Um, yeah, I uh, mean, oh. oh, I'm sorry. No, go, go on, go on. Okay. All right, uh, mine is a little bit less intense. Um, we do have Monday meetings uh, with with all of our department heads. And so the brewer, head brewer will tell us what we have a lot of, what we need to move. Um, the owners will kind of tell us where we are financially. And then um, I usually do, I usually meet with a few of my um, 
full-time bartenders once a week. Um, I like to talk to everybody as much as possible, but then I send out an announcement, like these are the things that we need to focus on this week. Um, so it seems to help, like as long as we're constantly communicating, I think that people feel involved and they feel like they wanna help out and um, it's been good. Brittany, when you send out the list of things to work on this week, kind of double question here, like how many things are on that list? And can you give us an example of something we might expect on it? Absolutely. Um, so I give them beer notes. So I tell them what's coming back in the tap room, what is going to leave the tap room soon and whether or not it's coming back, um, what cans we need to focus on. But then also procedurally, like are we slipping on um, reading out tabs to people before we close them out? Like how many returns are we doing? Uh, do we have events that are happening that you need to check the calendar for? Uh, kind of stuff like that. And Brad, thank you, Brittany. Mm -hmm. um, I meet with our managers every week and um, we'll you know occasionally go over numbers, usually the once a month, uh, we'll do that. And we'll maybe discuss how things are kind of going. Uh, and then, you know, I put together an analysis that I send out to all the managers at the end of each month of what we did in the tab rooms uh, overall, as well as um, what uh, that'll also go to the partners too. I used to clue in more of like in an overall, because we have team meetings every other week, um, what's going on in uh, financially with the team. And I've moved away from that. And, and, the, and I don't know that I, I should have or not, you know, that's one of those things I probably should check, but um i i got a lot of glazed looks you know when you're talking about when uh you know financial literacy there is a lot of times where like that i everybody on the team wasn't financially literate enough and i was like i don't know that i need to spend time there and also if it was negative i it was positive i share positive stuff if it's negative i found that they would get down on themselves and they do this and so i kind of moved away from that however there'll be various different things where I'll put together an analysis. For example, um, we had music all last summer and I looked at it when I kind of went over and I was like, did we make any money off of this? And I was like, maybe, but like not a whole lot. And I actually put together a yeah. financial analysis and I distributed it to some of the people and said, hey, this is why we're not doing as much music this summer because I don't think we made any money on it. And so I use that as a, you know specific things to kind of convey certain messages um, as well as, especially if it's going to be negative and I'm like, I need their buy-in to, to whatever it would be um and that would be negative but overall it'd just be positive hey we're up this amount thank you all that kind of thing but i don't get into the specifics now um i also will have on the the weekly meetings or every other week meetings will work on one thing so for example usually it comes from the secret hop or stuff it'll be like okay we need to be talking about the go beer or introducing yourself this month that's the one thing we want you to focus on just one thing uh, otherwise we find that it gets too much for some of the people um and that's that's kind of what i take the time instead of seeing it now if we it's hard to translate um, some of that, it, it's really easy to translate to go beer, right? Like you either had higher to go beer sales or not. And so that can be kind of like, you all did a great job with this, but it's harder to say with the introductions, does that just go into the overall number? It doesn't really kind of necessarily translate totally to a very specific number. So I wouldn't share that. So those are my thoughts. No, really great insight. I mean, we're here today to talk about how we can use data to make better decisions. And you're right, Brad, not everybody on our teams in the industry has the same level of financial literacy. And so, Audra, I'm sure you could talk for hours upon hours on this, but do you have any quick points about how we can take people who have very little knowledge of financial terminology and just what's going on and make them be able to understand at breweries and tap rooms? Yeah, I mean, it's, a lot of times the SCORE, like so your local SBA office or SCORE office, there's a lot of free resources that are out there for the small business community. And um, a lot of those classes are free to be able to take. You can have somebody that is um, an accountant or someone from the outside that gives kind of a 101 class to everybody at the brewery. It could be one of your leadership team meetings that you decide to do. Um, I know that I do that. I travel around a lot and I teach the basics of financial accounting and the basics of managerial accounting over one to two days. You know, and I make sure everybody understands that and they walk away with the metrics that they're going to be working with going forward. And from that point forth, it's just, you know, they'll tap back with questions, but you can take a, a local, um, you can take a class to the local community college. You can audit a class. Uh, you can bring the outside resources in, or if you have somebody like a Brad, you know, on your team 
they can also provide some basic financial education and that's part of one of your weekly or monthly leadership team meetings is an education component. So it's just making sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, I do a lot of that and um, I find that it becomes really helpful when you have a tap room manager that can talk about cash flow that is happening from the tap room with the head of production. You know, and they can talk in the same language that way too because they'll have metrics that intertwine together. One may be affecting the other. And so we can talk through those issues when we're meeting together as a team as well. So, yeah. There's and a resource out there. It Verify. sounds so basic, but you mentioned like, you know, speaking like the language of beer, you know, we have to be able to speak the language of beer Absolutely. as we're interacting with our guests and our staff, but to also run a successful business, you also have to speak a lot of other languages with regard to running the business. So everybody gets what's going on. Right. So, yeah. And, and it's important to have somebody that's coming in and talking to you or putting you on that same page that understands the beer industry, because we're going to talk in level of barrels and CEs. And, you know, variable costs and talking about the bill of materials and maybe, you know, our alpha acid read of this batch was different from last year's batch. Like if somebody doesn't have that beer knowledge or expertise or just even any of that background, you're going to be talking like you'll be an outside. It'll be like an us and them sort of situation. Like, oh, we have this accountant that's talking to us, but they don't know anything about our business. So it's, um, it's imperative that how we educate ourselves, we are using it within the thread of the beer industry included. So not out completely outside of it. No, I love that. So for everybody here today, I'd love to hear your top three taproom metrics. Take it however you like. I'd love to hear those three data points that are most important to you. And it's okay if we have reasons, but I think that'll just literally emphasize how important they are. Mm -hmm. So who's ready to jump in on this one? Um, I, I love to look at, I mean, I'm a gross sales gal. We have a really um, good mug club. So it, it, you know, it does bring our net sales down a little bit, but I love gross sales. I love average sales, you know, per customer. And then I just like to look at the flights every day. I want to see how many flights we did um, and try and figure out, is it the weather? Is it the, was there an event? Was it? people having time off, that kind of thing. Um, so those are kind of my favorites. And then merch. I love merch. So, Brittany, why do you like flights? Because, I mean, you know, and most people who have heard me write or li listened to me before or heard me write, I, I can't talk today, apparently. Um, I love flights as well. So why do you love flights as a metric? Well, the metric, I mean, I love that somebody is coming in because I know when I go to another brewery, I like to start with a flight because I want to see what they have to offer. I like beer. I don't just like one type of beer. Um, and I want to try the gamut of their beer. And so to me, that indicates that people are coming in. They're coming in with friends. They're coming in from out of town. Maybe they haven't had us before. They haven't been there for a while. Um, it just makes me feel like there's new life coming into the tap room. No, I love that. From the secret hopper side of things, the data shows from 2022 when the staff suggests starting with a flight, the guest is going to spend 27% more than when the staff does not suggest the flight. So and great that, educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. That doesn't hurt at all. Good metrics there. Um, for me, I, I do like net sales um, as a metric. We throw a lot of events and programming um, here at the brewery. Um, something that I'm, I've been believing in more and more is that there are, there are just so many breweries nowadays and everybody's making good beer. Like you can, you can drink good beer anywhere. Why are they going to come to you? Why are they going to drink beer at your establishment? So give somebody a reason to come to your establishment, do events, do programming. Um, and then how do you measure whether those events and programming is successful? Look at the data and see whether, you know, the stuff that you're doing is working. Like Brad gave an example of live music. That's a great example. That's something that we looked at also. And we were doing live music every Saturday. It wasn't quite like hitting the mark for us. So what we started doing is we started making it monthly and we would have slightly bigger acts that actually had bigger draws and that was worth it for us. So I, I do like net sales. Um, I also look a lot at our specific beer sales. Um, we, we do have a few core beers. We have like four core beers, but we have 20 beers on tap at all times. So we have a constantly rotating beer list. 
So I like seeing how our beers are performing, especially our new releases, because that's going to help inform our production schedule. If we're flying through lager or we're flying through fruited sour in the summer, um, that's something I can go back to our production staff and say, hey, guys, start focusing a little bit more on this um, or start slowing down on these things. So I like looking at our specific beer sales as well. Um, for me, I would say the, the first thing I always go to is, is revenue per bartender. So for scheduling purposes, mm -hmm. I look at that, like to make sure that I'm not over scheduling or under scheduling. Some of that kind of goes into tips too, when I look at that on a weekly basis, but there are moments where I'm like this, you know, uh, one bartender should be able to do X amount, depending, it's different depending on the actual location that we have. And if we have too much, that means that we're going to be screwing over the people from a tip standpoint. And, and that just doesn't work and then they feel ineffective. I mean, like there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So that's the first thing I, I kind of really always focus on. Uh, and in truth, I took over Barrel House again um, last summer. I hadn't been, I had been involved, but not, you know, the day to day kind of looking at the numbers to the same degree. And that was the first thing I did. Nobody was making any money. Um, and, and that's the other probable component of that. Like the tap room um, uh, employees weren't making any money because there was just too many of them on staff because we had just done too much. Uh, the revenue number per, per uh, team member was too low. Um, and that changed. I mean, like overnight in the, the course of the next few months, you know, we had had mass amounts of turnover and all of a sudden there was, uh, there's been almost no turnover um, since we started doing that and making sure that everybody was compensated well. And that really just came from that one metric. Um, the second thing is I look at days of the week uh, to kind of say, is somebody, um, you know, if you have, usually we have more than one bartender on, but like, it, is it one of these circumstances where we're seeing the growth throughout all of the days, or is it just on certain days? Um, why is that kind of the way that it is? Um, and so that's, that's something I look at monthly to say why compared to the previous year, you know, did we see the kind of growth? Why didn't we and that kind of thing? And some of it over a, a short period of time, like a month, you can't really tell like why are your Mondays, but you'll start to see patterns over a handful of those months. So that stands out. Um, and then I think that the, the, the next thing that I, I really focus on is the to-go beer ratio to um, kind of the draft sales uh, and saying, you know, what should that be? How can we get that up? That kind of thing. Um, and it, it depends a little bit on, on each brewery. So it's a little bit different on that. Uh, but those are the three that I, I mainly focus on, but I also, it also changes. I mean, those, some of those will probably be core things that I always focus on probably for the life of it. And then other things, like when you're talking about flights, I've noticed our flights have just gone down dramatically over the past, um, year. I don't know why, but like it has. And, and Brittany, when you're talking about like new people coming in, that's, that's interesting. And like we're up yet our flights are down and you know mm -hmm. and i look at barrel house i can we have i don't know how accurate this thing is on the point of sale but it shows like how many new customers and we're having new customers come in but it is not showing that they're going to flights now it could be a missed opportunity i don't really know but we're seeing it at both places and it's been dramatic at funk works and then it's been fairly dramatic as a percentage from there and that's information but again i don't know how to how to totally use that um but then that makes me think well let me start analyzing that and that might become one of my top metrics too as i start to look at various different things yeah after this conversation i'd love to see you analyze and push a little harder on flights next month and see what happens yeah, I just came back from Portland um, this last weekend, and uh, I ended up having to ask every place that I went whether or not they had flights because it wasn't super obvious whether or not they had mm. flights. Um, so I don't know. I would just say maybe that is one of the things. I know Andrew and Secret Hopper push the asking for um, asking if people want flights like we have a little flight card to go our flight card right on our bar and still people don't realize unless we're telling people hey we have flights if you are still trying to decide we may have to have another panel conversation on flights yeah, yeah. Audra, you know going to you i'd love to hear from your perspective what are the three like kpis you really typically are passionate about when interacting with the brewery Sure. Uh, also, I've noticed flights are down. I work with a lot of breweries, nine to 16 a month, and I look at sales mix all the time through the point of sale data. And I've also noticed that overall, regardless of the part of the country, the flights are down. Um, so I just wanted to add that on there. That's good um, my, information. Mine are very like, mine are more like projections and budget oriented because of my role and what I do for each brewery. So I look at average guest tab dollars. So how much has been spent? Is that going up or down? Why is that going up or down? Investigating it afterwards. But that's the main one. 
So that's, you know, the top line. And then I'm really focused more on the cost side. So I look at labor dollars spent per sales dollars made. So I'm looking basically at direct labor costs, like for the tap room side to make sure. So it's related to Brad's kind of uh, he's looking at sales dollars per uh, bartender that was so projecting on the revenue side. I'm looking on the cost, like how much are we spending versus what we're making so that I can figure out the labor component. And then I also look at fixed overhead per square foot as a percentage of sales dollars. Fixed overhead is not going to change regardless of the level of production or sales. There it is going to help contribute to your break even. And I practice divisional accounting with a lot of the breweries that I work with. So my brewery and distribution business looks a lot different from my taproom business, which looks a lot different from my restaurant. But I have costs that I allocate based on the square footage. So some are activity based um, and then some are square footage based. So I have a fixed overhead per square foot that the taproom takes up as a percentage of sales dollars because that's telling me um, am I spending more or less? Am I sales dropping? And therefore, I don't have a break even or I'm starting to go into lost territory that I have to start to make labor decisions, uh, changes, or uh, like I have to other types of spend that I have to start eliminating or changing. So mine's a lot more of like being behind the curtain of Oz. You don't see me throwing the switches and levers. So the, the KPIs, the close metrics that I'm looking at are largely kind of behind the curtain and not some of the more the obvious ones because I want to be able to recognize signs of financial distress before the owners feel it. Yeah, Audra, I am a little surprised you gave a Wizard of Odds reference versus Star Wars. That was kind of confusing <laughs> to me. Please don't yeah. do that again. That just messes with my brain. <laughs> okay, but, Thomas. So. Yeah, you all gave really great and unique metrics. So thanks for sharing those. And Brad, I want to kind of send it to you because you've talked about to go beer twice in this call already. And you know that's something I'm very passionate about. So we've got the data. We we can tell the team, you know, we want to sell more to go beer. But how are you able to use data to actually motivate them? Um, sometimes... Uh, there's two things that I've done in this particular thing. I don't know that the data does motivate them, to be honest with you. I, I mean, like, I think it motivates me to make changes, but I'm not sure that they care that much. I, because to a certain degree, some people, they're not making money on that, right? Like the to-go beer is, is somewhat problematic because they're like, well, why, what do I care about this from a priority standpoint? Because I'm not going to get tipped out on the to-go beer. And, um, and that's more of a problem now than to say it was 15 years ago or whatever. Like there's just differences in the industry that I have seen. Uh, but, you know, what I ended up doing that was the most successful and I took it away when there was a change in minimum wage, but we incentivized them by giving them uh, a dollar per to go beer item. And that worked, you know, if you, we People saw like that money. and then and I, I broke it out of actually how much it would be on a per hour basis that they ended up making more. Yeah, you know, we saw growth at, at that point in time. So is that that? And and I made it so, you know, I could I, I could show that to them too. And that was, you know, if they knew that they were getting this dollar extra, there was definitely. And also, it became apparent who was um, selling more as well at that point in time. Some people were really good at it, and other people weren't. Uh, but you know, that's the only way I found to be able to kind of move it. So to counteract something that you actually said about them not getting tipped on to go beer, it's really interesting diving into a set of secret hopper data that we have. When we classify visits, how the guest perceives it as say low engagement, neutral engagement, moderate or high engagement. When you look at specifically visits that are perceived as high engagement, the high engagement visit where the staff encourages to go versus when they don't encourage to go. So we've got the staff member who encourages to go and the other who doesn't. The one encouraging to go is actually gonna get tipped even higher than the person not encouraging to go. Higher percent. I believe it. Because they're probably doing a lot of other things that are checking yeah. out the boxes to build the relationships. I, and some of it honestly probably comes down to the people who care a lot care a lot and they're just devoted to whatever's going to be best for both the customer as well as the business and they end up doing a lot better but it's sometimes it is hard to motivate people in that particular regard and it's hard to say <laughs> it's just hard to even give them that and say like oh this is even like knowing that that's the case if i were to go to my team and say that half of them that are already doing extremely well are going to be like great that's even more i got it and the other half are going to be like eh, i don't care <laughs> you know one way or the other yeah. 
No, no, that makes sense. I mean, because we have people working in the industry for all different reasons. Some are specifically motivated by money and understand it. Some are just there because it's a job for a few months while they're in college and it might not motivate them just like you just explained. Yeah, so I've heard um, somewhere that the easiest way to um, sell something is to believe in the product. So if you really love beer, then mm -hmm. you're going to naturally just talk about it and try to sell it. So for Brittany, for you at Epidemic, how are you taking some of the data and using it to motivate staff to, you know, achieve certain goals? Um, mostly we're just trying to beat numbers from last year. So we have a lot of recurring products. Let's um, do this cookie and beer pairing. We sold this many last year. Let's let's try to beat our numbers last year from last year. Um, uh, same thing with recurring beers, like we sold out by this time. So let's try to sell out by this time, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, nobody pushes something that they don't enjoy or they don't, um, they're not trying to push things on people that that person doesn't want, but uh, it's definitely something that as long as you talk about it and you make it known that it's available, then, um, it's there. It's there. I think that people enjoy that. I, I know every time somebody asks, do you want anything to go? And the person goes, oh, yeah, you know what? Okay. They always tell me about it. They're like, got them. Got one. Honestly, I get so excited when someone asks me to take to go beer because I'll play a game with my wife sometimes and say I'll only purchase to go if they ask. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the data shows that they're not normally going to ask. And the other day they actually asked me and I didn't think I was going to get the third beer of the <laughs> night, but I got it back at our Airbnb. So it was a win. Nice. So, Brittany, a follow up for you, though. You know, you talked a lot about flights today. How do you get your staff to sell more flights and encourage them? Um. Honestly, you know, it's just a constant conversation. I think that uh, initially people were having a hard time making it feel like it wasn't robotic or like um, natural so um, or unnatural. So we've been kind of just trying out different methods of just being like, hey, just remind them. It's, hey, you want a flight? I love, I personally love when somebody wants to get a flight and they let me choose. Oh, it's my favorite thing ever. And so I have a couple of people like that that just love to do them. They just love to do flights. They love to offer recommendations. And then I have a couple of people that would rather not. And it is difficult. It is a challenge to motivate those people. Um, it's just constant reminders, honestly. Brittany, I think you hit on something that I've noticed a lot of. There is a, uh, a desire for the bartenders to not feel inauthentic. And so coming in and going through the motions of that particular thing, there is some resistance to do. Um, and I don't know if totally a way around. I mean, we again, the data does help kind of show like it, it's not going to feel incredibly robotic necessarily to the person who is listening to it, even if it feels a little bit robotic to you. Brad, uh, to echo off that, you know, it kind of feels like, you know, when you're behind the bar that you're just having the same conversation over and over again. But for the guests, you nailed it. It's an individualized experience. So it's the first time they're hearing it for the day and they might get excited. You know, Andrew, you really like that lager. Do you want to take some home? Oh, yeah, I would, I would love to. It's just finding ways to connect. So, Earl, when it comes to motivating your staff, what are some of your wins? Um, well, motivating the production staff is uh, really that comes down to when we sell something, when we sell a lot of something, um, that gets them excited. Like if we sell out of a beer really fast. So, um, you know, like we, like I said, we analyze our sales data pretty regularly on like our new releases and we see how they're moving. And just based on the first weekend of sales, I can generally forecast out what that beer is going to do for the most part. Um, but one of the things that we, we try to do with our draft list is we try to have a diverse set of styles. So we always, you know, we have our, our four core beers, but then we always try to have hazy IPAs. We always try to have a West coast IPA. We always try to have a stout, a sour, a lager, whatever it is. Um, so just looking at how the beer is moving and then getting the team to buy in like to that data, understand the data and say, okay, like this is doing really well. Like, um, you know, we give our head brewer a lot of creative freedom to brew what he wants to brew. But at the end of the day, like, hey, that Schwarzbier, 
didn't really move. Like, don't do I that. I want that Schwarz beer. You know what I mean? <laughs> Listen, it was great. It was a great Schwarz beer. I loved it too, but it didn't sell as well. You know, if we put an amber ale on tap instead, it's going to hit mostly the same customer base or or an oatmeal stout or whatever. It's going to hit the same the the consumer, but it it'll sell better. So just analyzing that data and showing that to them kind of like opens up eyes a little bit of like, okay, like I understand this. Um, and it just helps us make more informed decisions about what we're brewing. Um, and then as it relates to our taproom staff, you know, we were talking a lot about beer to go and, you know, I'll look at those numbers too. And we started doing a thing where um, if a customer buys, we found a lot of customers would buy two four packs. If people were coming in, a lot of people would buy two four packs. So we put in a discount where if somebody buys three or more, we'll give them 10% off. So that is a super easy upsell. First, our staff will ask if they want beer to go. And if they say yes, and they get two, say, oh, if you get a third, you get 10% off, just so you know. And then they'll end up taking a third home. And then that's something that they get excited about. Like, yeah, I got another one. You know, just like, like Brittany was saying. Um, Are you giving them any sort of reward for getting another one? Uh, well, what we did for a while to motivate our staff was we tried to make it like a competition to see who was selling the most beer to go. And then we would give them something like either a gift card or merch or free four pack or something, um, you know, for for selling the most. That does motivate them for a short amount of time. But over, you know, a couple months and it's like, OK, yeah, this is like whatever it's old hat. So we um, try to find new ways to motivate them. Um, so it's, you know, we, it's, it's just something that I monitor on a regular basis. Now, Audra, from your perspective, interacting with breweries, any yeah. examples you've seen breweries implement to motivate staff, whether it's rewards, some sort of recognition, some sort of opportunity mm -hmm. in the companies, how have you seen them best use the data points that you're preaching to actually see mm -hmm. results? Yeah, they, uh, they gamify it. They make it a game between each other. Uh, like, similar to like Pokemon Go, except you're using taproom metrics um, to, to hit particular goals or who's going to sell the greatest amount of their drink, the new cocktail that they've created, like who's got the most positive reviews. There's multiple ways that you can go about about doing that. But the basis of creating the prizes, so to speak, um, come from the owners. And I love that owners they get involved and understand like they get to know their tap their taproom managers they get to know their staff who likes star wars who likes uh hockey games like getting to know each other so that you know what makes each person tick and when you are creating those sort of prizes you're making it meaningful to that particular person because not everybody is entirely cash oriented plus they like to be heard and be and valued and so anybody that's going to get to know me as an individual, if I were a bartender um, and they knew that I love Star Wars and I also love live music, that, you know, here's what we'd be working towards or you'd have some time off to go trooping. Something like that is really tied to that particular person, not like you get a cash bonus or something that everybody, regardless of, of who they are, I like making it more meaningful. Um, I find that to be really cohesive for an overall team, which ultimately ends up in more positive and higher financial results for multiple reasons. You know, when you're a part of your customer that is in a tap room where you feel that everybody gels really well together, you wanna stay there longer. If you feel that there's some sort of power struggle happening between a couple people, or there's some sort of passive aggressive behavior between two bartenders, it doesn't make me feel as welcome. And so. <clears throat> excuse me so i would leave or i wouldn't stay for that extra beer plus it's uh so i'm tying it also from the customer's perspective and um but yeah gamify it turn it into a game make it fun we're there yes to have a good time and sell beer why not have fun with each other yeah, you, you nailed it. People make more money when they're happier, having a good time. Mm -hmm. They'll stick around yeah. longer. It benefits everybody. You know, it's not just about customized experiences for your staff, but you mentioned it too. It's about these perfect experiences that you're creating for your guests. So yeah. for those on the brewery side, you know, how are you taking data, using it behind the scenes, but somehow magically making the guest experience better because of it? Um, I think... I've been trying to do, um, I, I think I mentioned this to you already, but I've been trying to 
set merch out in like little pockets here and there just to see how that works. Um, and then I just kind of focus on that item. So like we put enamel pins on the bar right next to the cash register, just because we don't sell a lot of them. Like we sold maybe 30 of all last year. And um, just doing that, we sold 34 this year, which has been only a couple months since we put it on the bar. And I thought that was really incredible to see like, oh, these people really like the product. It is kind of an impulse buy, but just having it available and within arm's reach right there has been kind of a really cool thing to see um, the effect of. Thanks. Brad, how about you? How are you using data to make the customer experience better? Yeah, I was actually, when you asked the question, I'm not even sure that I am, to be honest with you. And I, I think that, the <laughs> thing that, that, that my focus has really been in the past year um, has, has probably been more on gaining more profit and getting rid of things that aren't working than it has been to really kind of focus on the customer experience. I, I think a lot of the, the customer experience that we talked about comes from the team and how, how well does the team gel? I totally agree with that particular thing. How well do they work together? Does there respect on it and this type of thing? And so that's been, that's been more my focus from a customer standpoint on the, on the data side, I've just been using it and saying, is this programming working? Yes or no. Is this where we want to put money? Yes or no. Um, and specifically, I would actually say at Funkworks, we've lost revenue and we've increased profit significantly. And then it makes me think I was just paying a tremendous amount for my revenue. That's that is the thing that that's I've been using the most data. So I don't know that I'm the best to talk to on, on that particular thing. What's something else you've gotten rid of? Um, merch variety. Uh, when I start looking at the numbers from a merch perspective, uh, I think that uh, we had way too much stuff. Like when you're talking about pins and things like that, we had tons of that. We our, our biggest merch year was incredible. It was double what we were doing now. And yet if I look at the profit from that merch year, it was awful because what happened is like we had an initial profit and then we get stuck on all of this inventory that would not move for long periods of time. And there is this desire going back to what we were talking about before where the staff's like, ah, we need more variety out there. And I'm like, no, no, no. They need certain colors all the time. And then we can throw in a one for flavoring kind of mentality. But but they're like, well, I get tired of wearing the black sweatshirt with the, the FW. And I'm like, totally agree. Understand. But yeah. like, that's what people want. You know, something, something like that. So I think we've thinned that out dramatically. And we are doing much less orders. And we're doing kind of a lot larger, larger orders of, of the particular things that are selling well. Um, I think that from a beer standpoint, you know, we had 20 taps. I have taken that down because again, I don't think it affects our, we're just paying a lot of stuff for, for that kind of thing. And we're like having beer then go bad. And it's just like, this is, this makes sense. So we've taken it down to somewhere, um, around the 12 to 14 number and we're, we're sitting there and, and it feels way better. Our inventories are, are down in that regard. Um, so those are, I've cut a ton of stuff. Sometimes I've overcut things. I mean, like that's happened too. I don't want to say that it's all been like, oh, I cut everything and then it always works in my favor. It does not. Um, but I'm probably been much more aggressive uh, on that side, especially when it comes to merch, quantity of beers, quantity of barrel beers, a focus on flights, you know, going back, that might be why our flights are down, but we're seeing them down, even though we didn't change any menus for a long period of time. But I wanted to focus on being at Barrel House being just the neighborhood bar. Like I were the neighborhood brewery, neighborhood bar. Um, we added a bunch of stuff. We added wine, we added, uh, we're adding mixed drinks. But at the same time, I don't necessarily need the same variety of beers that we once did. Um, and I don't think that, uh, I'm trying to think of another thing that we cut over there. Oh, that's, that's neither here nor there. Come. And at Funkworks, it's been very different where, you know, I've, I've been much more leaner but we still have a lot more tourism coming into this particular place because we are a larger brewery than, than the other. So my handling of things has been a, a bit different in what I cut and, and what I don't. Thank you for sharing that. Earl, anything you'd like to add about data and bettering the customer experience? Um, I'm kind of in the same boat as Brad. I usually use data for, for revenue uh, driven decisions, but um, that's what we use Secret Hopper for, to be honest, um, is getting feedback on the experience because you know we're biased we are not new consumers coming into to the tap room so getting a perspective of somebody fresh who's coming in maybe for the first time and them telling us in their words what they're experiencing helps us make changes from a service standpoint 
Mm -hmm. Are there any specific metrics that we help you capture that you really like looking at when the reports come in monthly? Because I know you can get so much data from your company financials and from your POS, but is there anything like secret hopper specific that you really find interest in? Um, I do like the, um, the level of engagement and then for them to elaborate on that, um, that usually they usually talk about the service that they're receiving um, in, in that. Sometimes you have to take it with a grain of salt. For example, we, we only do bar service. Um, you have to come up to the bar to order your beer. So if somebody sits down at a table, they're more likely to say, yeah, my engagement was kind of low. Like I only had two interactions with the bartenders and they were 30 seconds each. Um, so sometimes you have to take it with a grain of salt, but I, I do like that. I also like looking at the beer to go because Again, we're asking our staff to say it. So I always want to see that say, yes, I was asked if I wanted beer to go. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Brittany, how about you? Uh, physical menus. So I'm working on um, doing the beer menus next, but we just got the merch and food menus out. Uh, we just do snacks. We have food trucks every day. But um, yeah, that was a big thing. Um, I looked at the numbers versus last year and I realized we had some... Um, new like bigger items come in last year so i haven't seen it in the actual revenue yet like in the data um but we can feel it we can all feel the difference where um people are just grabbing that like pint glass because it's only five dollars you know so it's been and you're putting the merch prices on the menu is what you're saying we are putting the merch prices on the menu yeah and then we have the merch menu on every table yeah. yeah, menus are so important. We could talk about that for a long time, too, because, <laughs> you know, a few years ago, you could just have one type of menu when you went to a brewery, it'd be a chalkboard, it'd be a TV, it'd maybe be a physical menu. But now you have to reach people everywhere they're at. I mean, you have the QR codes nearly part of every experience these days, but also all the other ones that I just said at the end of the day, you know, how are you reaching every guest that comes into your tap room? The answer is probably having lots of kinds of menus, but they're going to spend more because of it. Yeah. Now, Brad, how about you? Any favorite secret hopper metrics? Um, you know, the engagement thing is something that uh, I think about often. And I even was remembering the last last months and I was like, ah, I see a pattern with with uh, with how this is going. Um, I think that overall, I take a lot of it with a grain of salt, too. Like there, there you're always going to get like these people who are just either against you or whatever it would be. But you start to see the trends of of what it is and that gives me um a lot of indicators and i think that the one that engagement part of it when when they explain that uh, i just gain a, a tremendous amount of insight that i would not have uh unless that sometimes it reinforces it sometimes it makes me question whatever it is that i'm thinking but that's that's the thing that i gain the most out of it yeah, to go off your engagement, you know, while that's great, I love taking that engagement from the secret hopper survey and just correlating it to actually tip percentage because mm. the, the data shows that, you know, Earl, let's pick on you for a sec. Say you're getting an average tip of 17% and, you know, Brittany, you're getting 27%. Brittany's engaging at a higher level. Brittany's making more money. She's going to be happier. She's probably going to take well longer. I mean, there's a direct correlation between those two metrics. But at the end of the day, you know, it's about using all kinds of data to maximize your mm -hmm. tap rate. You just can't do one. And, you know, we could talk for hours upon hours about other metrics we like to look at and, you know, ones that aren't as, you know, front and center. But, you know, as we wind down, I just love to go around the circle again. And from your own perspective, and Audra, we'll start with you on this one. You know, I love to hear what's one thing you believe taproom managers and owners should do after watching this with regard to taproom data. With regard to taproom data, oh my goodness. Well, I mean, share that information with them. Um, I also, I forgot to mention that I also look at taproom loss, like sellable liquid per keg. I try to, to also, like, because that's at the taproom level and the staff level that they have a, a way to control it. I find that to be another one that we definitely is underrated or underutilized. But um share the information and see what like what could the next steps be what 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 can we apply to our tap room let's take a look at calculate some of these metrics that we as a group have come up with on our own or find out where those data data repositories lie because a lot of that the calculating these numbers begins with where do those numbers come from where does that information reside is it easily accessible 
can I calculate it on my own or do I need somebody else's assistance in order to get like the numerator or the denominator, whatever it may be. So really understanding what data repositories we have, how can we apply that and what like there could be some that are food oriented. We didn't even talk about that. That could be incorporated as well. So I just think it's just a good starting point to share this information with taproom staff and then come back and say, let's create our own sort of set and um, together as a team. Do it as a team. That's the most important thing. Love it and appreciate you being here. Now we'll go in the reverse order from what we started. So Brittany, your turn. I actually really agree with Audra on that because I think that thinking about the level of engagement with the taproom staff, they want to engage, they want to help when they feel included. And if you're including them in these conversations about, hey, this is what we're doing and do you have any thoughts on that or what are you hearing in the tap room from customers about what they want and what they are, um, they're doing on their weekends and, and whatnot. I think that's really important. Awesome. Well, thank you, Brittany. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Brad? Honestly, I had I like wrote down notes uh, for this, and that they they took it effectively. It was create a list of the items that you know if you're not doing it already of six things that you want to go go back six months and and kind of um, go forward uh, and and make sure that you know see how things are going so you have some sort of history. But uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else where I like a, even like a key takeaway that I learned from everybody else. Um, that I, I'm probably going to do. I think maybe sharing. I think I'll probably go back and share more of the metrics as time goes on with the team as a whole. Um, you know, I had done that historically. I've done a lot less of it since COVID. I think it's probably time to revisit and see what they kind of care about. Let me know how so it I goes. I would suggest that for others. Yeah. And take us home, Earl. Um, well, certainly understanding your data. Um, if you're not looking at data, if you're not using it at all, you need to start. But two quick things I'll mention is um, using data to be smarter about what's on tap. To Brad's point, you don't need 20 beers on tap. Um, if you have 12 that are really pointed that sell well, that's good. But look at your sales data. And then events and programming, what's working, what's not working. Um, do events, do programming, please do them, but also be smart about it and figure out what you're spending on these events and is it worth it. Earl, last question for you. Do you really have over 10,000 untapped check-ins? According <laughs> to your website, you do. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an avid consumer. <laughs> I love it. Well, everybody, thanks for being here today. Earl, Brad, Brittany, and Audra, you offered so much advice. We could talk about taproom data for a very, very long time. But at the end of the day, the taproom is the epicenter of your company's experience. And you can make a lot of money there. So everybody, good luck. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye.